Well, good morning, everybody. Kia ora tato katoa. Uh, my name is Claudia Orange. I'm practice leader of research at PAPA, and it gives me great pleasure to be chairing this session. Uh, David Hackett Fisher's paper that he'll be giving tomorrow does cite an attorney in the United States who said, scratch a lawyer, find an historian. And David goes on to make the point that the conference is a happy example of those two converging lines. It certainly is. We are a little shorter on time. Um, each speaker will have uh, 20 minutes only, um, so there'll have to be a bit of conflation there. Uh, the questions at the end, um, and I will be giving the, each speaker a little bit of warning before that time by tinging the jug. Um, the first speaker I'd like to introduce is Professor Shauna Dorset from the University of Technology in Sydney. Shauna teaches in the area of property, law, equity, comparative native title and legal history and publishes in all of those. Her title is How Do Things Get Started? Legal Transplants and Domestication, two examples from colonial New Zealand. Shauna. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking the organisers, in particular Mark and Joel and Anna, of course, and the New Zealand Centre for Public Law. And I feel that I have to thank the New Zealand Law Foundation twice. I have to thank them for having me here and for helping to bring me over. But also I have to thank them because some of um, the data that is in this paper comes from a current project that I have that is funded by the New Zealand Law Foundation which is looking at Māori and the British courts, 1835 to 1852. So I'm doubly thankful to them. And I should say that in, to be more expedited today, we'll be having one example. Whether I can do that in 20 minutes, we'll see. Now, unearthing, I think, is a problematic task for many legal historians. To some extent, it assumes continuity between the past and the present, that by tracing backwards or forwards, we can identify, uncover or recuperate traditions. Its imagery is of unbroken, seamless lines and genealogies, stretching from the past to the present, or the present to the past. Most problematic, I think, is the question of when does something come to be thought of or identified as a tradition? As a matter of method, do we start with some practice or institution or event and go forward, hoping that at some point we find that they have become understood as traditions, or do we go backwards? From some practice we now identify as a tradition, to try to discover its origins, seeking to identify when it first came to be seen as something with the character of a tradition, for it most likely will not have been understood as such at the time that it started, whenever in fact that may even have been. Now, of course, to start this way is not to say that these are either impossible or necessarily undesirable tasks, but they are tasks of which many, I think, legal historians are very likely to be wary. Such an enterprise is probably most closely aligned with the tradition of history writing which draws on Foucault's archaeology, whereby one examines the discursive traces left in the past in order to write a history of the present. Archaeology looks at history as one way of understanding the processes of what we are now. Or, one could self-consciously write a kind of practical or presentist history and this also well, often takes the form of a history of progress, tracing the emergence and the forms of legal institutions, and particularly constitutional institutions. It is, as Paul McGew has, I think, recently reminded us yet again, a history told of the past for the purposes of the present. But this is, of course, an approach that sits well with the role and task of lawyers. And I think in saying this, I'm really just badly echoing some of Andrew Sharp's earlier comments. However, for some legal historians, of which I would count myself as one, what matters is conceptual and intellectual understandings in a particular time place. These understandings are often linked to institutions, broadly understood, regardless of their later trajectory or how they might allow us to write a history of the present. So rather than unearthing, this paper seeks to start at the beginning of settler judicial institutions in colonial Aotearoa, New Zealand, and to think about how things get going in colonies. It pays attention to foundations and to the ways in which colonies organise their legal institutions, their forms and their practices. These foundations may or may not later become identified with some pattern or practice which comes to be seen as a tradition. Now, in order to do this, the paper as a whole, the written paper, draws on recent literature on legal transplants, 
And I'm going to examine one example of a transplant in New Zealand, a very basic institution, that of the Resident Magistrates Court. So this paper seems to take, and to be honest, possibly does take, a somewhat tangential approach to the remit of the conference. It looks to foundational institutions rather than to constitutional foundations, although the extent to which these are separate may not in fact be that great. However, thinking about transplants and movement of legal forms around empire is, I think, one framework which might, which might perhaps help to explain the New Zealand origins of practices and institutions that might come to be thought of as founding traditions. At the same time, I think, this paper seeks to push back a little bit against any rejection, and to the extent that any rejection is in fact implied in the terms of the conference, of the number eight wire approach, so beloved of New Zealanders, at least from Australians' perspective. Not just to constitutional change, but to understanding legal origins and traditions at all. So what this paper simply seeks to do is to remind us just how pragmatic the legal origins of British colonies often were, of the ways in which discourses Practices and institutions circulated the empire, finding new homes, becoming domesticated, worked and reworked into new forms in response to local circumstance. Now, the literature on legal transplants offers an important way into thinking about the study of legal history and to the ways in which institutions and traditions moved around the empire. The idea of a legal transplant connotes a very simple concept that rules, institutions and concepts themselves are often derived from or influenced by those of other places, that they move from one place to another, where they are put to new use. Now, there is a significant body of literature in this area, and more detail is provided in my written paper. I don't intend to go into any of this, particularly in this presentation, as this paper is not intended as a contribution to debates on how to understand transplants nor is it a paper which seeks to provide any definitive origin for the resident magistrate's court. As I said, my intentions are simple, to consider a specific institution as a reminder of the pragmatism that often underlay choice and design of colonial institutions. And this paper contends that the resident magistrate's court, not just a simple little court, but is in fact a striking example of the movement of legal form and its transformation on the basis of local innovation for local circumstance. Now, to the extent I do want to say anything about transplants in order to kind of get going, because I clearly still haven't, um, this paper specifically draws on the particularly useful approach of Chris Tromlins in his article, Transplants and Timing. Now, institutions such as the Resident Magistrates Court are not, as we know, conjured out of nothing. Transplants were regular occurrences in empire, and New Zealand was, of course, a relatively late acquisition for Britain. By 1840, Britain already had colonies in far-flung places, Newfoundland, Tasmania, the Cape. And there was, therefore, a ready pool of judicial institutions of varying different kinds that had been established for some time and which could provide some inspiration for colonial officers in New Zealand. Now, one such institution was the English Magistrates' Court, as modified for particular colonial circumstance in other locales. Now, transplants do not just include the institution itself, but the discourses, the ideologies, and the intellectual strategies that underpinned institutions and institutional design. As Tomlins puts it, they include long-established ideas that furnish a respectable genealogy, familiar practices adapted to serve new purposes. And in the context of the project of English colonisation of the New World, he outlines the need for promoters of colonies to resort both to broad, discursive, extra structure of ideas that explained and justified enterprises, and a more detailed technical infrastructure of institutions and processes. For both, law was a major institutional, of major institutional and ideological importance. For Tomlins, both the extra structure and the infrastructure are legal transplants, picked up from one place and embedded into a new context. Now, in the written paper, these ideas are applied to the institution of the Resident Magistrates Court, and specifically in its engagement with Māori. And the justifying ideas and discourse of assimilation that in part underpin the transplantation, oh dear, too much coffee probably, underpin the transplantation and the transformation of that institution for local circumstance, so the infrastructure and the extra structure. <laughs> 
And now I'm afraid comes the boring lawyer's bit. So the Resident Magistrates Court Ordinance was enacted in 1846. It's unclear whether it has a direct precursor, but in form it's based, it seems, on a melding of a South Australian Act, the Magistrates and Justices Act, and the previously enacted 1844 Native Exemption Ordinance of New Zealand. Notably, Governor Gray, who introduced the 1846 Resident Magistrates Court Act, was also Governor of South Australia from 1841 to 1845. The South Australian Act established resident magistrates' courts throughout the colony of South Australia and was based on legislation in force in the Cape, showing that nothing is ever new. In the Cape and South Australia, the resident magistrates' courts were established for two, pur two purposes, prosecution of minor offences not amounting to felonies and recovery of small debts. Both appointed resident magistrates to districts, established resident magistrates' courts, conferred jurisdiction particularly in civil matters on matters not exceeding 20 pounds, and there was no right of review or appeal for criminal or civil matters. Now, minor offences were, of course, the traditional fare of magistrates' courts, both in the colonies and in England. Benches of magistrates came together to form the courts of general and quarter sessions. However, while minor criminal offences were the staple of magistrates' courts, petty civil matters were not. At that time in England, magistrates' jurisdictions did not extend to civil matters. Um, they were the province of courts of request. Now, from the beginning, the South Australian Act was thought to be flawed by many. Jurisdiction was too wide, there was no right of appeal, and the upper limit was only £20. But all of those features that were terribly unpo unpopular in South Australia were, in fact, standard features of courts of request in other jurisdictions, including, for example, New South Wales. Now, there were several attempts in South Australia to amend the Resident Magistrates Court Act, and in response to an 1843 report on this matter, Governor Gray, later Governor Gray of New Zealand, noted that it would be better to prevent the contraction of small debts than to allow courts for their recovery, labelling such courts positive nuisances. However, despite Gray's apparent dislike of small debt courts, in 1846 New Zealand had a number of such courts, Gray inherited a court of requests and added a New Zealand magistrates court. Now in South Australia, in New South Wales post-1846 and in New Zealand, the granting of minor civil jurisdiction to magistrates recognised the practical difficulties of administering justice, particularly in civil matters, in colonies that had distant settlements. It was often difficult for litigants to travel to the nearest court of requests. Such courts were invariably held in towns leaving those far afield with no recourse to civil justice. Uh, problematic was the sitting times of high courts, such as the Supreme Court, which only happened four times a year. And this led overall to an issue. How reasonable was it to spend a certain amount of money to enforce what was, in fact, a relatively minor debt? In proposing a bill to the Legislative Council in New Zealand for the establishment of a resident magistrate's court, Governor Gray alluded specifically to the problems caused for the administration of justice by the, quote, dispersed nature, character and pursuits of a proportion of the European population. Now, the New Zealand Resident Magistrates Court had a similar general jurisdiction over petty civil matters and criminal matters as its South Australian counterpart, including all of the features which were so unpopular in South Australia. However, despite many commonalities, what made the New Zealand ordinance different from both the Court of Requests and its South Australian counterpart was that much of the Resident Magistrates Ordinance was directed towards the engagement of Māori with British law. In form, one might say, that the Resident Magistrates Court Ordinance is a kind of legal bricolage. In form, it has a number of antecedents. It's a pragmatic melding of elements of different regimes, recycling them and recasting them for a new time place. That cannot be so. <laughs> that isn't even possible. Hmm. Okay. In civil matters, therefore, just for John, the ordinance broke new ground. It enacted a regime specifically for Māori for civil debt enforcement. Resident magistrates were given jurisdiction in all civil matters where at least one, Māori, one party was Māori, up to £100, which was a lot at that time. And where both parties to a civil matter were Māori, the court reconstituted itself as a court of arbitration, 
where two native assessors quote, one to be chosen by each of the parties sat with the resident magistrate. And in many ways, it was ex it's extraordinary in the history of empire that an Indigenous group would resort to a civil court so early in settlement, but resort they did. In the early days of the operation of the ordinance, Māori appeared before the resident magistrate's court, often as plaintiffs, far more commonly than did settlers. There was also a petty criminal jurisdiction. However, the, court, the ordinance not only modified English criminal procedure for Māori, but in fact for non-Māori. The thrust of it was to simplify and facilitate the prosecution of larceny and receiving stolen goods, the most common crimes in the colony. In particular, the ordinance drew on the earlier 1844 Native Exemption Ordinance, allowing that there would be, um, there was a differential scheme, I guess you might say, for penalties. Um, one that more approximated the traditional approach of utu, or reciprocity, for cases of theft. Rather than prison, a fine of four times the value of the goods stolen or received could be imposed. Now, as I have absolutely no hope of getting through this in the time allocated, I'm going to summarise a little and then move back into my paper. So one of the things that I point out in my paper is that if you want to look at the extra structure of this, the discourse and the ideologies, what we see here is a discourse of assimilation. Um, but I don't want to be unnuanced about that. I've drawn on the work of Damon Ward, who has pointed to the different strands of assimilationist thought which um, were prevalent in empire at the time. And largely, one could say that these fell into two categories. The idea of exceptionalism, that you needed exceptional laws because it was impossible for indigenous groups such as Māori to internalise the values, if you like, of the British legal system at the time. Or you have the more strict um, applicationists who believed that to tolerate custom or to allow Māori or other indigenous groups such as indigenous Australians to resort to their own law was simply to put a brick in the a step in the path to civilization, which inevitably required at some point assimilation to occur. Now, while Governor Gray was, I think it might be said, further towards the strict assimilation camp, there's no doubt that the resident magistrate's ordinance is a very pragmatic um, example of exceptionalist assimilation thought. Okay, it allowed for native assessors, it allowed for a court of arbitration, and on the criminal side, it modified procedure and it also allowed for significant modification of penalties. Now, what I'd like to do, if I just have a few minutes left, I hope, is to draw just a little bit on some of the data that's coming out of um, the project I'm doing on Māori and the British courts. And that is to mention perhaps one case, both civil and one criminal, that comes from a very small remaining data pool on the resident magistrate's court from the um, Whanganui resident magistrate's court in the late 1840s. And I think this shows um, the workings of this ordinance really well. Now, typical cases across the country on the civil side involved claims for non-payment of goods, almost always pigs, or non-payment of wages, um, particularly in Auckland. And I'm just going to mention one or two cases here from the Court of Arbitration. Now, records are really scanty from the Court of Arbitration. This is the court that sat when the Resident Magistrates Court reconstituted itself as a Court of Arbitration with native assessors, one chosen from each side, in the rare cases where it was an inter Māori dispute. So, in the first case, Hona Tuafiti and Hona Whakapō, we have two assessors sworn in for the plaintiff, and one for the defendant. Now, this was described as a case of criminal intercourse, but was, in fact, more likely a case of criminal conversation. And for those who aren't familiar with the lovely term criminal conversation, it's a civil, tortious wrong for adultery. And it is, in fact, the most common, in fact, it's almost the only, um, all of the cases from the Whanganui in this era which involve inter Māori disputes are all criminal conversation cases. Um, generally, the charge was admitted, and the standard fine for criminal conversation or adultery in, the, in Whanganui in the late 1840s, you'll be pleased to know, was two pounds. This can be contrasted with a number of duck and keep geese cases, which is most common, along with pigs, stolen goods, um, the value of a duck being five shillings. Now, what we see is we see some really interesting cases where lists of native assessors are brought forward, where those who are seeing as having mana in the community sit 
and have a right to determine civil cases. And this is an extraordinary set of exceptional laws. Now, criminal cases, on the other hand, can provide insights into the workings of provisions which modified penalties. In, Reverend, in, Wong, in Whanganui, Reverend Taylor, very well known, accused Te Atua, Taraki, Honihemu and Wirihoa of two counts of larceny, namely, yes, stealing of duck and geese. All four were found guilty, but different punishments were imposed on each of the men. Te Atua was to pay twice the value of the two geese, 12 shillings the pair, to Mr Taylor, and a fine of 12 shillings to the public. Honihemu, being unable to pay, was sentenced to undergo 30 days hard labour in the streets of Petrie. Widi Hoa was to pay twice the value of the duck, and Taraki was not fined. Although on the same day, Ta'atua and Taraki were also found guilty of the theft of three ducks belonging to Henry Churton. In that case, Taraki was ordered to pay a fine of 15 shillings and to undergo two weeks hard labour. Ta'atua was not fined. It seems that the resident magistrate imposed only one fine on each, despite the two crimes. Now, to conclude then, as I think I have to, the institution of the resident magistrates court in New Zealand facilitated strong Māori engagement with the law in the 1840s, perhaps feeding into an observation once made to me by my dear friend and former colleague Richard Boast, that in the 1860s, Māori strongly engaged with the native land courts, no doubt because they already had much experience with British courts in the past. Māori have proactively engaged with British law since the beginning of the colony, and of course they still do. Is this a pattern? Is it a practice? Or is it a tradition? I'm not sure it's any of these, and it's certainly not perceived as by anybody in 1846. But it is an observation, and it's one that comes as no surprise to most New Zealanders. The Resident Magistrates Court is an important example in Australasia of a legal transplant. Its history shows a singular transformation and domestication of an English institution, and dare I say tradition, of the lay justice of the Institute of the Magistrate, transplanted via other colonies and adapted for local circumstance and need. It also shows, however, how much of the British Empire was started by happenstance, the chance location of individuals, and a bit of legal bower birding. Perhaps if there is a tradition revealed in this paper, it is not one of constitutionalism, but it might be one of colonisation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Dorset. I'd like to introduce Dr. Damon Ward, um, who's a senior associate at Simpson Grierson. He was previously a Crown Counsel at Crown Law, uh, specialising in Crown Maori issues. He was a Rhodes Scholar and a Beit Senior Scholar in Imp Imperial and Commonwealth History at Oxford. Damon has published widely. Um, his uh, title of his paper is Settler Politics, Courts of Revision and the Maori Franchise Before the Maori Seats. Damon. In 1853, 78 Māori men from around Otago applied to vote in provincial elections. The Constitution Act in 1852 set out the franchise and it did not specifically exclude Māori. There were three ways that you could qualify to vote. It was a property franchise and three sorts of property were required. Men over 21 qualified to vote either by being seized or entitled to a freehold of a certain value, by having a leasehold estate, again of specified value, or thirdly, by being a householder of a tenement, again with values specified in the Constitution Act. The decision on whether someone was indeed qualified to enrol to vote fell to the bench of magistrates, sitting as, what was, sitting as a court of revision sometimes called a registration court. So this meant that the Dunedin lay magistrates, many of whom had no legal training at all, had to consider questions of customary title, of the identification of freehold and leasehold and their value, and of householder status. There are also disputes about Māori enrolment in Wellington and in Auckland in the 1850s. Now, none of the Otago applicants to enrol to vote were successful. But small numbers of Māori were enrolled, some as freeholders, most as householders, in other electorates. I think that these disputes, the disputes that were generated by Māori applications to enrol to vote, can tell us a great deal about the constitutional culture in the 1850s, and that 
in turn, uh, I think, can encourage us to think more critically about how we describe constitutional traditions today, what we leave in when we talk about a constitutional tradition, and perhaps more importantly, what we leave out of our description of constitutional pasts and constitutional traditions. In 1858, in response to debates about electoral law, the colonial parliament asked for an opinion from the imperial law officers, from the Attorney General and Solicitor General for England and Wales, on whether customary title held communally qualified for the franchise. The law officers found that customary title could not qualify Māori to enrol to vote, because what was required, the law officers said, was a freehold or a leasehold or being the householder of a tenement. Those things, they said, were terms of art in English law. It required an estate or a tenure that was known to English law, and customary title was not an English estate. It was not a type of property interest that a common law court or a court of English law could grasp and could recognise. They also said that Māori habitation of houses was unlikely to qualify as a householder interest under the Act because they suggested communal uh, social arrangements, which was how Māori social arrangements had been presented to the law officers in the material sent by the Parliament, that sort of social arrangement didn't allow you to identify a single householder who was the head of a separate home. Now, the law officer's opinion is relatively well known in the historical literature, but the provincial background, the provincial politics behind these disputes, and the legal opinions that are produced within New Zealand at the time of the courts of revision are less well known. Revision courts heard a range of arguments about the status of the treaty, about the nature of customary title, and about Māori social organisation. The law officer's arguments in 1858 had been anticipated by the Attorney General of New Munster, New Munster was the Southern Administrative District in New Zealand, had been anticipated by Daniel Wakefield, um, the Attorney General of New Munster, about six years earlier. And also, very interestingly, I think, in Wellington, the disputes about revision courts are tied quite closely to shifting political alliances between senior rangatira in Wellington and the Manawatu and various factions in Wellington provincial politics. So the revision courts, and all of these things are left out of most accounts of uh, the early politics of the 1850s. So the revision courts suggest a much richer set of constitutional debates than appears in many accounts about the 1852 Constitution Act. But courts of revision disappear by the end of the decade. So I'm conscious that what I'm talking about today is a small part, a small story, in many ways a precursor to the Māori Representation Act in 1867. And I'm not concerned with expounding a specific constitutional tradition that we can identify and reflect upon today. What I want to suggest is that courts of revision are relevant to some broader themes of this conference. They help us look more critically at the construction of constitutional traditions, how we narrate the formation of constitutional traditions. As I said, what we leave out, what we choose to exaggerate, what we choose to neglect, I think they do this in two ways. In particular, courts of revision show the importance of low-level courts and what you might call low politics for debates about the Constitution and the practice of constitutional politics and constitutional status. And they show, particularly in terms of debates about householders, the value of thinking more broadly about the social and cultural attitudes and racial attitudes that shaped the construction of the colonial constitution because many of the things that shape how people uh, discussed householder qualification can't be found in the statute, they can't be found in the regulations. They're a, um, an expression of particular cultural and social attitudes to what it was to be a political citizen, what it was to be a member of a particular political community, and how you measured whether or not a person was at a point that they were ready to be admitted to a particular status within that community. I should stress that my focus is on what these disputes might tell us about Pākehā politics, and about Pākehā attitudes 
to the Constitution. I'm very conscious that some historians, most notably Alan Ward, stress the Māori involvement in early provincial elections as being a key point in the development of Māori political thought that leads ultimately uh, to the formation of the Kingitanga. Uh, but I'm going to leave those strands of, of constitutional construction for others to discuss. So I'm conscious that I'm going to have to shrink a number of, of things together here. Let me just very briefly tell you about the process because the institutional structure was very important uh, in how people argued about and thought about and had to deal with Māori claims to enrol to vote. The electoral rolls had to be uh, published every year. You applied to enrol to vote, your name was published um, in a prominent place, the regulations said, and then anyone else could challenge your right to vote. And if a challenge was made, it was heard by a court of revision. A revision court comprised at least three lay magistrates. Most of the revision courts appear to have been um, chaired by resident magistrates. So this is a very different system from the one in England and Wales after the 1832 Reform Act, because there you have professional barristers who are appointed as, as revising barristers. Now, there's one other element of the colonial setting that I think is worth keeping in mind. Colonial le elections in the 1850s it seemed to many observers were awash in beer, bribery and fraud. Uh, and this affected how people viewed Māori attempts to vote. Uh, the, conduct of, of Auckland, of, uh, sorry, the conduct of elections in Auckland was particularly notorious. In 1855, according to one estimate, there were over 800 more registered electors in Auckland than there were male inhabitants. The consensus seems to be that was because everyone was engaging in, uh, in dodgy behaviour, so no one objected to anyone else's applications to, to vote because that would reveal the uh, extent of uh, illegal practices. And so revision courts were never held and the number of names on the roll just kept on growing and growing. So let me say something more about the revision court in Dunedin in 1853. This is the first um, revision of the electoral roll after the Constitution Act has been proclaimed. And Pākehā and the settlement saw the attempts by Māori to enrol to vote firmly in terms of local political rivalries. In Dunedin, there'd been a series of quarrels between the resident magistrate, Strode, who was appointed by Governor Gray, uh, and the supporters of William Cargill, the head of the Otago settlement settlers. Cargill's supporters saw attempts to register Māori voters as part of an ongoing attempt by Gray's supporters to undermine their political dominance in the settlement. The, witness, the Otago Witness, the newspaper that was run by Cargill's son-in-law, conveniently, uh, alleged a conspiracy amongst pro-Gray magistrates to enrol Māori. Uh, and the sense of conspiracy, um, in the minds of the Witness at least, was helped along by the fact that Walter Mantell, the Chief uh, Crown Purchase Officer appointed by Gray, seems to have encouraged Māori uh, in Naitahu Reserves in Otago to enrol to vote. Um, Mantel had fallen out with Cargill and was seen as a rival to Cargill. Perhaps as importantly, at the time of the revision court, Mantel was in the middle of trying to placate Naitahu leaders who were complaining about the failure to pay the rest of the Murihuku block purchase monies. Uh, and it's Cargill's supporters who get the opinion from Daniel Wakefield, the Attorney General, uh, and Wakefield's approach is similar to the approach that the law officers take uh, several years later. Aboriginal title, he says, isn't sufficient to, found, to, to meet the property qualification. Freehold and leasehold are tenures in English law, not Māori custom. Wakefield thought that New Zealand company reserves might qualify people to vote because company reserves in Wellington, he said, had been sold entirely to the Crown and then the reserves granted back. But in Otago, he said, the reserves that uh, Naitahu people were living on were simply unextinguished native title. So there was no underlying uh, crown grant or crown estate. One of the interesting things about the um, Otago Revision Court is that the Naitahu applicants are represented by David Scott. Uh, Scott was a whaler and sealer. He'd been... Uh, 
Wakefield's interpreter during the negotiations for the Otako block purchase. Um, the senior Naitahi Rangatira Tuawaiki assigned his share of the purchase monies to Scott uh, to build a boat for, for Tuawaiki in Wellington. Um, and indeed, after Tuawaiki's death, um, Scott is sued by the administrator of the estate for the, the completion of the arrangement. Uh, this is also the same David Scott who uh, is the litigant in the saga of Scott and Grace and Scott and Grimshaw, the 1840s cases that some of you may be familiar with that tell us so much about Chapman and Martin's views about land grants uh, and uh, early land law in the colony. The Otago witness reported that Scott argued that the Treaty of Waitangi had the force of an act of parliament. He argued that the treaty recognised Māori title and therefore colonial law must be capable of recognising customary title. And then he argued that a crown grant was after that a mere formality. Remember that the Constitution Act said that you had to either have or be entitled to a freehold grant. And Scott said, well, there's title, we all know there's title, so people are entitled to a crown grant. He said that individual subdivision was perfectly possible amongst Māori uh, and said that it was done in Wellington uh, and therefore the freehold qualification could be met. Now if the magistrates discussed these points with Scott, the discussions aren't uh, recorded. Indeed the sources about these courts are very scarce and they are almost entirely silent, well they are entirely silent, about um, the motivations and perspectives of the Māori applicants themselves. On the whole, it's presumed by Pākehā observers that uh, the Māori applicants are being led through the hustings by electoral agents, that they're filling in pre-filled out cards, which was the common practice within the Pākehā electorate, that they were given large promises of alcohol and other adjustments, again, an extremely common practice in elections at the time. Uh, and so there's a presumption that Māori simply don't grasp the significance of the franchise. Uh, the Dunedin magistrates gave their decision without retiring. The first application by Te Atua of Moiraki occupation settler, according to the application, uh, was rejected and Scott then withdrew the applications of all the other men uh, and admitted that he himself had no claim to enrol to vote uh, because he was living on customary land. So if the controversy in Dunedin related to freehold and title, in, in Wellington the issue is much more one of householder status. Um, much of the controversies in Wellington related to Māori from Otaki, uh, enrolling in the Wellington Country District for the provincial elections. By the mid-1850s, Otaki is a thriving Māori commercial centre. Um, there had been extensive remodelling and rebuilding of the town, uh, overseen by Tamihana Teraparaha and others which had attracted the attention of Governor Gray, who saw it as a kind of model village for his amalgamationist policies. And Octavius Hadfield, the Archdeacon of Kapiti, was based in Otaki, and Hadfield was active in promoting enrolment to vote amongst his parishioners. Uh, so between 1855 and 1857, there's a, a rapid increase in the number of Māori from Otaki who enrolled to vote. By 1857, 38 of the 40 Māori enrolled in the Wellington country seat were from Otaki. Uh, two of the Otaki men, Tamihana Teraparaha and Mātani Tafifi, the two people who are so critical to the early history and discussion of Kingitanga, uh, those two electors in the Rangatira are listed as freeholders and the rest qualified as householders. Uh, there are a number of other uh, Māori assessors, native assessors, who are enrolled to vote in other Wellington seats at the time uh, and some of them are listed as freeholders of native reserve land, uh, and that presumably is the type of qualification that Wakefield had in mind when he talked about the company reserves. Hadfield's activities deeply concerned Isaac Featherston, who was the head of the provincial government in Wellington. Featherston complained to the central government. He alleged that missionaries were planning to lead Māori like sheep through the hustings and to swamp the colonists. Uh, Māori enfranchisement became, rather, became caught up in a series of rather bitter and personal political disputes within Wellington settler politics, and Wellington settler politics in turn became caught up in a series of controversies and, and political tensions within uh, Manawatu Māori communities. 
when Hadfield publicly favoured Featherstone's political opponents, Tamihana Teraparaha endorsed Featherstone's party. Pākehā canvassed for votes in Otaki, uh, including in holding electoral meetings in the houses of various rangatira, uh, and actively sought endorsement uh, and petition gathering work from rangatira. Uh, this comes to a head in 1858, in July, when there's a revision court in Wellington. Um, the applications of over 100 Māori had been challenged by Featherstone's electoral agents, and on that occasion it was the evidence of Māori witnesses that was critical to the rejection of the applications. Um, I'll, I'll pass very quickly over that, um, because I want to stress the importance of the householder qualification and the way that householder qualification was argued about in the 1850s. In the debates about whether or not people qualified as householders, the style of housing, the type of housing, the number of windows, whether there was a chimney, all of these things are seen not so much as a measure of the value of the property, which was the statutory test, but as a measure of the uh, civility or the civilization that had been reached by the applicant. It has to be said that this criteria is applied far more strictly to Māori applicants than it seems to have been applied to Pākehā applicants. Um, one of the reasons that the Otago <coughs> settlers were convinced there was conspiracy by pro-grey magistrates was that pro-grey magistrates had had the audacity to actually closely test whether or not Pākehā applicants had um, a sufficiently valuable house to enrol to vote. Um, Māori newspapers at the time actively promoted what was called European housing as a sign of prosperity and development. And Tamihana Teraparaha's so-called Pākehā style house was often presented it by settlers as symbolising his leadership and a high degree of, effectively, of assimilation, of adoption of European uh, ways. And I guess I, this really reminds us of the significance of political and institutional practice to the actual life of the Constitution. The criteria that's applied and used is not something that comes from the statute or the regulations. It's an expression of the particular culture and the particular politics which is engaging with the constitutional document. And I think that's a valuable element that needs to be borne in mind if we're searching for constitutional traditions relating to institutions or constitutional structures, that the, um, the application and the operation of these things on the ground needs to be considered. And often it's not considered in the way that we narrate our constitutional history and past uh, at present. It's the standard of parliamentary housing that features in the parliamentary debates about uh, Māori registration in 1858, uh, but there the issue becomes twisted slightly because the Stafford government proposed that you had to have a Crown grant underlying your title. Um, that's opposed by many of the appointed members of the Upper House because they saw that as part of the Stafford government's broader push to cut down on the governor's ability to independently set Māori policy. Stafford, in 1858, has a whole series of statutes that are designed to, <coughs> bit by bit, chip away at the independent prerogative, at the independent governor's power, and the two houses are deadlocked over the electoral reform legislation. And the reference to the London law offices is a compromise uh, the Crown Grant proposal is dropped from the legislation uh, and in return for that falling out of the bill, the House of Representatives gets to send a reference off to London. Um, the, the franchise debates are now largely forgotten. Partly that's because few studies draw any links between the low politics in magistrates' courts and the creation of a constitutional order. Our appreciation of the past is limited as a result, I think, and that must limit the extent uh, to which we can inform and critique discussions about the present and about the future. So while it's possible to identify constitutional traditions in these debates, the treatment of custom and common law in some ways is a very firm tradition uh, in 19th century jurisprudence that Shauna and Mark and I have all written about uh, in different ways in different places. Uh, but I'm skeptical about, the, um, about structuring historical inquiry 
around searching for a constitutional uh, tradition because of the risk of foreshortening that Andrew Sharp talked about, because it leaves out a great deal that may tell us uh, a lot about the constitutional culture of the past and therefore give us much to reflect on about the constitutional culture uh, of the present. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. Ward. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Hickford now. He's an Oxford graduate. Um, he's recently published uh, Lords of the Land, I suspect his doctoral thesis. Um, since 2010, um, he's been in the Prime Minister's advisory group in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. He's presently on secondment to the Ministry of Primary Industries as the Chief Legal Advisor and Director of the Legal Services Directorate, where he leads a group of some 40 lawyers. His paper is Considering Historical Political Constitution, Reflecting on Some Constitutional Traditions and the Imperial Inheritance. Dr. Hickford. Apologies in advance for the brutality of this presentation because of the, the haste. We are in, in our own age of forgetting. New Zealand's buried historical constitutions live with us still in fragments, but they are slipping into the obscurity not only of forgetfulness, but also mismemory. A palpable risk is that we will, are or will be unable to think about constitutionalism beyond a narrowly construed Northern American or latter-day European legalism, or perhaps the genres of economic analysis and public management. Nor should we be permitted to speak narrowly of positive law alone, as if legislation and the pronouncements of courts exhaust the possibilities of what it is to think or act constitutionally or to reflect on constitutions. This, I believe, has been a theme of the discussion earlier today, as well as the preceding addresses by Damon Ward and Shauna Dorset. Historical scholarship ought to be the foe of caricature and reductionism. And so this presentation's exercise, as well as the theme shared by my colleagues on the panel, is not simply an antiquarian exercise. One possible byproduct of recovering otherwise neglected or misremembered pasts is to multiply possible resources for reflection and thought in the present, and, in my view, to humble us. Thus, when looking at terms like constitutionalism and, say, liberalism, or democracy with a richer sense of historicity, we may see semantic continuities, but conceptual ruptures. And speaking of forgetfulness and mismemory then, this presentation is as much a study in discontinuity, change and difference, as well as dormancy in strains of constitutional thought and practice. And in terms of dormancy and discontinuity, Miranda Johnson's work, for instance, in the New Zealand Journal of History, uh, paints these very themes in relation to Whanganui and the Waitangi Tribunal reporting on the Whanganui claims. This stance is not to produce a usable past or a teleological history, as Herbert Butterfield rightly critiqued many years ago. Rather, an understanding of the past can help us appreciate how far the values embodied in our present ways of life and our present ways of thinking about those values reflect a series of choices made at different times between different possible worlds. The point is to granulate our sense of various pasts to help liberate us from the grip of any one hegemonic account of those values and how they should be interpreted and understood. Ultimately, one should approach those myriad pasts with a sense of humility as opposed to one of condescension. I'll briefly examine in the space available uh, some of the arguments around the normative values of political constitutionalism, and perhaps with some reflection on the possible meanings of that inheritance for these early 21st century decades. George Dyer, the prolific author educated at Emmanuel College at Cambridge, wrote in 1812, when we contemplate a political constitution, we should have in view not a baseless fabric floating only in the imagination of a poet, but a real structure that would be brought into use and practice, imperfect, indeed it may be, yet in the main durable, and though ruinous in part, yet habitable by people. 
While the term political constitution was certainly active in the particular past this essay is interested in, it is also a heuristic device, one that allows us to use a speculative formulation to analyse past phenomena. If one is to distill a central value for political constitutionalism, its key normative trope is to seek to amplify the space for politics as well as contestation within and through politics. As a key word, it describes a diverse range of moments of historicity, historical instability and change. We see a form of creative indeterminacy where relations are conditioned and reconditioned but seldom settled conclusively for all time, even though there might be punctuated moments of agreement and settlement for a time. Positive law and legal genres buttressed this form of legal, uh, for this form of constitutionalism, but did not subsume it. A dynamic contingent picture of conversations without end and fraught processes presents itself. The ancestors of the people in this room in the 19th century were aware of constitutional complexity and reveled in it. They practiced the arts, the politics of negotiability. Policy makers and others, whether indigenous or non-indigenous, grappled with the challenges posed by multiple political autonomies of hapu and petty colonial bridgehead settlements. In considering these broad background points, I will argue, if I can, in a brief moment, the New Zealand Constitution Act 1852, mostly seen too simply as attributable to Sir George Gray's authorship in the secondary literature, hosted a variety of different strains of constitutional thought. In large part, these aspects reflected radical Whig liberal and Tory liberal points of view, but these varieties have since been elided and forgotten. Nevertheless, they resonate. In essence, the three takeaway focal points of Whiggish and liberal Tory perspectives were, first, an emphasis on the representation of varied interests in order to ensure balance, contestability and diversity within the design of the political constitutional framework, and not the mere privileging of majoritarian numbers through elections. Secondly, the adjustability of the re representation of interests through time so that the constitutional frame was sufficiently flexible to adapt as circumstances altered. Thirdly, ensuring that aspects of the design allowed for minority interests to be guarded, or to put it another way, to ensure the vicissitudes of popular opinion were not unduly master politics. What may be referred to less than illuminate, illuminatingly as pragmatism may host a range of intellectual and political genres. These islands were not a place for what I referred elsewhere as banal constitutionalism, a reflexive, non-analyzed acceptance of a constitutional setting that is rarely, if ever, tested. To this end, I will also briefly discuss an alternative constitution that was drafted and prepared in 1852, which the colonial office referred to somewhat mysteriously as the MS Project. Uh, but this is merely one illustration of something that can be found in the manuscripts. The very historicity of a political constitution, then, is a vital ingredient. The embedded inheritances of preceding decision points, intellectual strains of thought and compromises, all of which condition a sense of what choices may be plausible in a given peculiar community or a set of communities, uh, can be lost. This brings to mind the observation that what is able to be legitimized or explained to others politically or legally depends on resources or tools to hand, although as histories show us, this need not preclude resort to exogenous sources, including those drawn from Northern America, which very much was in evidence in 1840 and beyond. Quentin Skinner has said, even if your professed principles never operate as your motives, but only as rationalizations of your behavior, they will nevertheless help to shape and limit what lines of action you can successfully or rather plausibly pursue. Ultimately, irrespective of whether we are talking about New South Wales, the Cape of Good Hope or New Zealand, a skeptical approach to human nature was assumed in considering constitutional design from the perspective of policymakers in London as well as in settler communities. The orientation was to give ample space and autonomy to contestable politics to work things through, rather than insulating communities from politics. Importantly, this was not some ideal state. It was as messy and untidy as the frailties of humans and their myriad lives. 
Importantly, there were a variety of Whiggisms in early and mid-19th century Britain, as was the case during the preceding century. And this complex of various Whiggisms largely set the terms for constitutional debate, not only about the 1832 franchise reform legislation in Britain, but also considerably later into the 1850s. As the late John Borrow of University of Oxford has pointed out, Whiggism of this mid-19th century liberal tenor was infused with a sense of plural interest to be accorded political standing and recognition. In the developed formulation of Whiggish theories with this particular accent, these interests corresponded with the identifiable collective interests in a community, mercantile or commercial, colonial, landed or propertied, and professional, although specific lists as to those interests might differ in certain details from one commentator to the other. The importance of political diversity and ongoing contestability was acknowledged. In this, there was a desire to protect minority interests, otherwise outnumbered, and not to let the role of mere majoritarian numbers prevail. The balance of continuity and innovation was integral. Walter Beishot famously drew the picture of a veil or protective screen of archaic element, elements and incremental progress or change underneath. An ancient and ever-altering constitution, said Beishot in the Fortnightly Review in 1865, before publishing his now better known the English Constitution, is like an old man who still wear, wears with attached fondness clothes in the fashion of his youth. What you see of him is the same, what you do not see is wholly altered. Thomas Babington Macaulay remarked, constitutions are in politics what paper money is in commerce. They afford great facilities and conveniences, but they are not power, but symbols of power, and will in an emergency prove altogether useless unless the power for which they stand be forthcoming. Underneath it all, Earl Grey, the third Earl Grey, who was a key secretary of state of the colonial office and in certainly one of the main authorial contributors to the New Zealand Constitution Act 1852, as well as the Whig Macaulay, appreciated that law for the unwary may become a straitjacket on the energies of a, of a community. If deployed wisely and with a sense of its adaptability and changeability, it could be a timely liberator of appropriate deliberative energies in a society. In these circumstances, legislation within a predominantly political constitution was seen as a device or a means for adjusting legal measures to the conditions of social change, remedial in its scope rather than revolutionary, enabling and facilitative of political creativity as opposed to a hardened and entrenched constraint. We liberals of the mid-19th century, such as the Third or Grey, disagreed with the case for expanded democracy made by philosophic radicals of a Benthamite hue, or aligned, aligned with James Mill's arguments for an increasingly democratic constitution. James Mill, writing his essay on government for the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1820, criticized orthodox Whig notions of constitutional balance and controversially recommended a suffrage for all men 40 years of age and over. In the Elder Mills account, the public interest would be identified principally with the vicissitudes of public opinion as majorities formed and reformed on the issues of the day. Not for him, non-radical Whiggish ideas as to representing distinct interests in communities, such as the landed interests and manufacturers or merchants, all of which he called representation by clubs. While philosophical orientations might have been shared amongst Whigs in and also liberal Tories, particular styles or details of design might be disputed hotly, and tribal Westminster politics might thwart concurrence, at least in the open. Thus, although the New Zealand Constitution Bill bequeathed to the incoming minority Tory administration of the 14th Earl of Derby and Sir John Packington as the new Secretary of State for Colonies in late February 1852, bore the hallmarks of Earl Grey's behind-the-scenes handiwork during the preceding Whig ministry of Lord John Russell, the measure was not insulated from assault. William Molesworth, uh, who is a famed colonial reformer and liberal, and but not necessarily aligned with the senior aristocratic Whigs, criticized the New Zealand Constitutional Bill in the debate of 4 June 1852, stating that the benefit of an upper chamber was to introduce a conservative element in circumstances where the lower chamber would be more responsive to public opinion. The only way to make the upper house effective, he said, was having it elected by the people and allowing its members to sit for a longer period than those of the lower. He protested against 
what he called a nominated second chamber as being contrary to what's the sound principle of balance of power, that Whiggish trope again, which he thought ought to exist in every government formed on an analogy to the Constitution of England or of the United States. As we shall see, Earl Grey put forward this very idea in private discussions with Sir John Packington's office when the Tories came in, although Packington's eventual settling on a nominated legislative council won out and disappointed uh, Whig critics. Here then was a complex inheritance from the United Kingdom transmitted to colonial theatres by way of legislative design, one practically forgotten now, but undeniably rich in its nuances and various applications. Along with authors such as Thomas Babington Macaulay, Guizot's, uh, Francois Guizot's lectures at the Sorbonne on the history of civilization in Europe, translated by William Hazlitt in 1846, and subsequently, were, as John Burrow has suggested, influential transmitters of a philosophy of history to Whig and Tory strands of constitutionalism. Comparable messages were also located in James Madison's commentaries as one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers under the name Publius in 1788 on federalism. In his view, balance meant that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. For those wishing to proceed in the face of opposition and contest, the luxuries of irresolution and fatigue were not permitted. Interest was to be pitted against interest, all in competition and contention with each other. Differences and dissent were to be encouraged. The challenge for government was to weave all these tangled threads into a fabric of law and direction. Diversity of represented interests within a constitutional setting enabled what Bagehot would eventually characterize as government by discussion, or a polity of discussion in 1873. That is, Bagehot advocated a picture of contestability in which the sovereign power is divided between many persons and in which there is a discussion amongst them, irrespective of whether a so-called free state or a state with liberty was framed as a republic or a monarchy. He expressed discomfort with those who sought to evade complexity and the discussion that it invariably occasioned. This is not to be anachronistic. Bagehot's conclusions drew together threads attributable to Whiggish liberal perspectives, especially but not limited to those of Macaulay, distinguished forebears otherwise lost to our contemporary gaze in these islands in the 21st century. When speaking of constitutional design, interests to be represented in colonial contexts were analyzed rather abstractly, the point being to ensure whatever politically salient interests might be represented would be balanced against other identified powers in the community. Earl Grey did not rigidly apply one set of norms or approaches. His view was flexible, informed by a historicized sense of particular changeable circumstances and transitioning communities. When speaking of Britain's parliamentary government in 1864, he warned that a mere expansion of the franchise and an ending of small borough seats would convert our constitution into an unbalanced democracy. Thus he supported what he called the cumulative vote, a form of plural voting, whereby every elector was given as many votes as there were parliamentary members to be elected from a constituency to which the elector belonged. He suggested this cumulative vote include the right of giving, either giving all those votes to a single candidate or of dividing them between the various candidates available. The object, argued Earl Grey, would be to secure to minorities a fair opportunity of making their opinions and wishes heard in the House of Commons. In this vein, he referred to the Constitution in the Cape of Good Hope from 1850, which used a cumulative vote system for the upper chamber the result being to give greater weight to, in his words, independent electors who are not thoroughgoing partisans on either side. Earl Grey's recipe for parliamentary reform suggested boosting representation for university seats, an educational franchise, he called it, reserving seats for particular professions and reserving seats for certain social interests, including the legal profession and those of the working classes. He used that term. I'm not aware of any reason, he argued, why those who have worked in certain trades for a given time should not be registered and formed into a corporate body with the right of electing members of the House of Commons. If that were so, he continued, the working class might have the power given to them of choosing enough representatives fairly to express their wishes and feelings in Parliament without the risk of giving them a monopoly of the representation by a large reduction of the franchise. For the universities, he suggested expanding the representation in the House of Commons for the universities of Oxford and Cambridge from two members each to four, again applying the cumulative vote. 
Likewise, in 1858, he supported reserve seats in the House of Commons in order to ensure the presence of a variety of represented interests. As such, balance as a constitutional trope of the Whiggish variety was dynamic and somewhat defensive. It was not static. Reform and adjustment to changing circumstances was envisaged. Change with continuity was a key theme in Whiggish notions of a living political constitution. If the English constitution showed change through benign stealth, the colonial theatres of New Zealand, Australia and the Cape Colony were also places for deliberative design as much as gradual change. Techniques such as plural voting, one person exercising more than one vote for a particular chamber in a legislature, specifically reserved seats for certain interests in a political community, upper chambers with Crown nominated members or members elected for longer electoral terms as with the United States Senate, were all calculated to shape and to preserve a delicate, a delicate balance of interests and to protect minorities. In 1850, Earl Grey supported plural voting in a single chamber for the Cape of Good Hope Colony, hence his approving references to that particular model as it subsequently operated in the bicameral legislature there in the second edition of his work on parliamentary government in 1864. In addition, basing his approach off the preceding 1843 legislation for New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land, Grey experimented with the concept of a legislative council where one third of the members would be appointed by Her Majesty and the remaining members of the council shall be elected by the inhabitants of the relevant colony. It was thought that relatively robust provincial legislatures would counterbalance any tendencies towards central overreach. Earl Grey looked forward to the time when the pro provincial legislatures he was proposing for New Zealand would sink into little more than district councils, municipalism in the substantive sense. Reflecting on upper chambers in the colonies, Earl Grey mused that legislative councils composed of members appointed by the Crown have in general had little real influence over public opinion, while they have been attended with the great disadvantage of rendering the assembly less, of, less efficient by withdrawing from the scene where their services might be most valuable, some of the persons best qualified by the enjoyment of a certain degree of leisure by their character and ability to be useful members of the popular branch of the legislature. The solutions were seen as various as seen in relation to Australia or Southern Africa. As for New Zealand, Earl Grey wrote to Sir George Grey in private correspondence that the mode of election by the separate legislatures should be one which may secure some share of power to the minorities in those bodies. Earl Grey's worry was clear when he said, it is obvious that if as, as is possible there should be an extremely democratic party having a majority in each provincial legislature, it would be able to have the entire nomination of the upper house in the general legislature if the election of members of this body were conducted in the ordinary manner. Yet, he concluded, if each member of the provincial legislature were entitled to give all his votes in the manner I have suggested to one candidate, it is clear that a minority consisting of one third would be enabled to name one of the members elected by each provincial legislature. Searching for a tool to mitigate the problems he anticipated with elective upper chambers, that might become a mere repetition of the assembly, he suggested that members being elected by the provincial legislatures as the senators in the United States are elected by the state legislatures would be a useful tool. Thank you. Earl Grey's draft heads of a bill for the government of New Zealand in 1852 proposed legislative councils for each of the six provinces, consisting of a body of members, no less than 27, one third of whom were to be appointed by the governor and two thirds of whom were to be elected the minimum of governor-appointed members was to be nine. The Legislative Council of New Zealand, so the upper chamber of this house, was to consist of 15 members, three to be chosen by the provincial councils by way of election on a cumulative vote. Now, all this came to naught. Uh, Packington, the incoming Tory Secretary of State, defended a completely nominated Legislative Council to the governor George Grey, on the basis that a comparable approach had been taken in other colonies, including Canada. In a deleted passage from a draft dispatch of 3 March 1852, Packington was to have written, but I may observe that in addition to the ordinary arguments in favour of the established usage, Her Majesty's Government have also been moved by the consideration that the exclusively popular character given to the local councils seemed more especially to require some counterpoise in the general legislature. Shifting to a purely nominated legislative council in the 1852 Act, or to put it another way, retaining it from the 1846 Constitution Act of New Zealand, attracted concerted criticism in the Westminster Parliament. Molesworth's comments I've already stated, 
and Packington acknowledged that Earl Grey decided that one third of the members should be nominees, and the Governor of New Zealand had recommended the adoption of the same course. Adderley, Charles Adderley, a Tory, objected to the nominee chamber because it was the caricature of the House of Lords, adding these nominees were not in the independent position which belonged to members of the House of Lords in this realm, they were merely tools of the Crown, carrying on through an additional department of legislature that which pervaded too exclusively all our colonial constitutions, namely the Crown and nothing but the Crown. Gladstone, William Ewart Gladstone, likewise criticised Packington's proposal for a nominated upper chamber. Packington, in response to Gladstone, supported nomination. The Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for the University of Oxford, said he wished to draw a precedent from the United States of America, whereas Packington's answer to that was that he would rather draw a precedent from Great Britain. These inheritances shaped constitutional design for New Zealand. Rivalrous powers and interests were to be set within a constitutional frame. The New Zealand Constitution Act and enactment of the Imperial Legislature at Westminster set up hedgerows and thickets with points of influence, counterbalanced by others entitled to cause difficulty or challenge. There were three key areas of focus in constitutional design to achieve balance and contested diversity. First, developing local institutions responding to provincial constituencies. Secondly, sustaining a careful relationship between central and local concerns with a view to minimizing centralizing tendencies. Thirdly, maintaining Crown-nominated or managed parts of the system insulated from the vagaries of popular opinion, such as governor-centric diplomacy with Harpu, and of course the Tories landing on a nominated upper chamber. Now against this background, the MS project was inserted into the debate, and that in itself responded to these various pressures by advocating provincialism and localism as a counterbalance to Crown nominees and popular opinion. The interesting life of this project is that the Peelite Tory, Gladstone, was actually seen as the advocate for this and received a manuscript copy which lies in his personal papers in London. It was infused with the constitutional preferences of radicals. It advocated a localised process for constitution making on the ground in New Zealand through a constituent council rather than one set out imperially. The benefit of such an approach would be to give a stronger hand to settlement-based politics specific to places like Wellington, Nelson and New Plymouth as they tried to secure advantages against the governor. On analysing the MS project, Herman Merivale, the permanent undersecretary at the Colonial Office, observed how the MS bill contained sets of provisions on the following subjects. The composition of what he called a constitutional council, the functions of the governor, limitations on the power of the legislature which are reasoned necessary by the removal of the Crown's ordinary power of disallowance of legislation, the constitution of a Supreme Court apparently to decide in each case whether the legislature has exceeded these powers. Merivale also focused on the manner in which provincial boundaries might be settled. In Lord Grey's plan, the fixing of the boundaries of the provinces was left to the governor, but it was intended that he should be instructed so to limit them as to include in them as nearly as possible the settled lands. He added that the rest was left under the control of the general legislature, but with the power to the governor to set apart Aboriginal districts where native usages should prevail. As Merivale noted in the MS project, mainly the same object is attempted, but in a different way, as the provinces are to consist only of such lands as have actually been purchased from the natives, whereas all the rest is left under the legislative authority of the governor. While he acknowledged the latter proposal as a more complete method, he considered it to be difficult in practice. Lands are purchased from the natives, not in compact districts, but in bits here and there. There will be, as it seems to me, much intersection and confusion between districts within the provinces and districts subject to the governor. So in a very brief conclusion, mid-19th century New Zealand affords a unique glimpse of these various adaptations of constitutional thought, as does Australia and Southern Africa but the distinctive features of British constitution making and constitutionalism still lurk, even though we are left simply with the fragments and the outcrops. These rich historical inheritances should not be forgotten, nor should we simply see them as restricted to printed outcrops. To obtain a sense of historicity in the political constitution requires a searching gaze, but also a willingness and the patience to listen with care. Legal sources and ways of speaking are used as a resource and are important that cannot be exhaustive or determinative of everything that is constitutional historically. <laughs>
The plea then, as per the comments of Shauna Dorset and Damon Ward, is for a richer engagement with the historicity of constitutions and constitution making, specifically within political constitutions, which are to be viewed as encompassing a broader field than the pronouncements of positive law, whether in statute or through common law. Thank you. Muttering to Mark, it's the socio-political environment that is always very interesting. Um, we always say that uh, in many uh, times I've been in public forums where it's said that the Right Honourable Sir Geoffrey Palmer QC needs no introduction, but I'd like to introduce Sir Geoffrey in the way that I've been um, encouraged to do. Geoffrey was a uh, law professor in the United States and New Zealand for some years before entering politics as MP for Christchurch Central in 1979 and then subsequently, as we know, had held many posts, Attorney General, Minister of Justice, Leader of the House, Deputy Prime Minister and then, of course, Prime Minister. In 1994, he became a foundation partner of Chen Palmer, public law specialist, where he remained until 2005 when he was appointed president of the Law Commission. He's appeared extensively um, in the superior courts, including the Privy Council. And then for eight years, he was New Zealand's commissioner on the International Whaling Commissioner, Commission. Sir Geoffrey is a distinguished fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Public Law and the law faculty of the Victoria University of Wellington. Sir Geoffrey's paper is The Strong New Zealand Democratic Tradition and the Great Public Meeting of 1850 in Nelson. Sir Geoffrey. Kia ora tato. And in deference to the Chief Justice, I will keep my voice moderate. Uh, the title of this paper stems uh, from an accidental encounter I had with this great public meeting in Nelson in 1850. I'm not a legal historian, as are the other members of the panel, and I defer to them with all due hum humility. I have been writing my memoirs, and my great-grandfather, John Palmer, arrived uh, in the New Zealand's second Wakefield settlement in Nelson in March of 1843. And when I was looking through papers past, which is a marvelous historical uh, ability to give you what was going on, and we had a marvelously active colonial press, too, much more active perhaps than we have now, uh, that uh, you could find that John Palmer in 1850 with 35 others signed a public notice in the Nelson Examiner calling for a public meeting to discuss the principles upon which the New Zealand Constitution should be based. And what I draw from this very rich load that is contained an entire edition of the Nelson Examiner. They had to postpone the publication of the paper for a week, so they published everything that happened at this meeting, and the meeting lasted 12 hours. Now, I, I thought this was a remarkable constitutional occasion, and the inferences that I want to draw from it are quite modest. They are, first of all, that it is really interesting to find out their ideas, their emerging ideas on democratic theory and practice, and secondly, the elaborate processes through which they went in their deliberations. I, I think it's quite remarkable how concerned these citizens were with the way in which they were governed, uh, and that is really what this paper is about. Now, the meeting itself uh, was one that actually was an amazing meeting because it was held on the 27th of December 1850. We hadn't in New Zealand at that time got to the point of closing down for Christmas. Uh, and it began at noon and it terminated between one and two in the morning with only a short interval for refreshment. The newspaper reports that it was attended by 
400 persons who were present at some time during the deliberations. And that, of course, must have constituted a very high proportion of the population of, of Nelson then, which was 3,400 Europeans and 1,400 Maori. The in very interesting question about how the Maori question influenced these debates in, in, is really worth mining the examiner of this, uh, uh, this edition of the examiner in itself. I won't go into that in great detail, but it's very interesting how that came out. Now, the, the whole point uh, about this I think is that these people were highly educated and they were innovators and they were determined it seems to me to secure a future form of government uh, that put them in charge. Uh, the arguments were based on, on a number of emerging principles. Chartism was a very influential part of their background. The leader of all this uh, was Edward Stafford. Uh, Edward Stafford was later three times Premier of New Zealand and he had been in England a Chartist. He was a member of the Anglo-Irish Ascendancy in Ireland but in Edinburgh he addressed Chartist meetings and there, were, uh, there was another Chartist in, in the group as well who had been active in the 1832 Reform Bill uh, in, in England. Now uh, the, the whole point was, I think, that they really wanted what we would call open democratic government. And their great enemy in this, they thought, was George Gray. Uh, Governor Gray was a person whose modus operandi did not attract the confidence of the settlers. Uh, and indeed, it's really very interesting when one examines uh, Gray, there is the Crown Colony Government in New Zealand, which is a very good book. Dr. McClintock says, and I quote, in point of fact, Gray was engaged in a double game and playing it to his own rules and satisfaction. As a man of avowedly liberal principles, anxious to be acclaimed the father of democratic government in New Zealand, he felt himself cast for a major role in the drama of constitution making. But as an autocratic self-willed governor bent on shaping native policy to his own inclination, he was determined to postpone on every possible pretext that boon which the colonists so eagerly desired. Now, Gray's uh, contribution to New Zealand's constitutional traditions is, of course, uh, as important as it is elusive. And I don't want to get into that because we have a very complicated question, as the previous papers have illustrated, about the interplay between the Imperial Parliament at Westminster on the one hand and the settlers here on the other. And one of the things I want to suggest is, and if one looks at Dr. Foden's uh, book in the, uh, about New Zealand's uh, called the New Zealand, the the Constitutional Development of New Zealand in the First Decade, it was published in 1938, he went to England for two years to study uh, the documents that resided there to get to grips with New Zealand's constitutional uh, positions. Well, I want to suggest that it's just as rich a tradition to study what the settlers here were thinking and what the Maori were thinking. It seems to me we finally got around to that, but it's taken a long time. Uh, and and the, the interesting thing about it is that uh, these people had quite advanced ideas, I think. Uh, the, um, there were constitutional associations set up in Wellington, in Christchurch and in Nelson, and in, later in Otago. But it was, I think, in Nelson that the first strong expressions of discontent came and they were directed against Gray's plan to have a nominated rather than elected council for New Munster. Uh, and indeed, uh, the interesting thing is there was a lot of interplay between these constitutional associations. The one in Wellington was very strong. Uh, and of course, Stafford, who was married to one of the Wakefields, came over, uh, he was married to Colonel Wakefield's daughter. He came over here quite a lot, and there was a lot of interchange between them. 
But in any way, the sequence of, of events uh, in 1850 and 1851 is really interesting. They published in the Examiner in November 1850 uh, a public notice to the effect that because it was the intention of the UK government to introduce the establishment of representative government in New Zealand, the inhabitants of the settlement are invited to meet on the 27th of December to consider whether it might be advisable to recommend suited, uh, certain provisions suited to the requirements of New Zealand to be submitted to Her Majesty's ministers with the view to their being embodied in the proposed bill. And the same edition of the examiner contained a public notice saying uh, that a public meeting should be held to form a constitutional association and that would be held at the Nelson Literary and Scientific Institution the Nelson Institute, which still exists and has its special statute. I'm the patron of it. Uh, but the interesting thing is that they also elected a subcommittee that drew up a draft statement of the principles of a on which a, a constitution of New Zealand should be framed. And that was drafted by Stafford and several other people, and there were 13 principles. And they went around and had a number of meetings around the province, as well as the major meeting to which I have already referred. And it, what they found was that there was very vigorous debate, but they were able to refine the issues in the course of those uh, regional debates in a way that enriched, I think, the debate at the main meeting. And all these principles were published in the examiner, uh, and the examiner also published uh, a report from the Wellington Independent about what John Robert Godley had said to a meeting of the Wellington Constitutional Association. And Godley, of course, had only just arrived in New Zealand. He hadn't really got to Canterbury yet, as far as I can tell. And what he said was, the object which the colonists of New Zealand have given their energies to obtain, and which they will obtain if they be true to themselves, is something very different from a mere form of a constitution. It is the substance which all such forms are but methods of exercising. In a word, it is political power, the power of virtually administering their own affairs, appointing their own officers, disposing of their own revenues, and governing their own country. Now, the result was that this meeting came together on December the 27th, and the principles that had been advertised and which had been debated at these preliminary meetings were debated again in a way which, which is extraordinarily high-quality debate. I don't think we could debate the Constitution at such a level now. But in any event, uh, the, uh, the, the agreements they reached were quite radical. They said, first of all, in the opinion of this meeting, the legislature of New Zealand shall consist of a, of a governor and two houses of representatives. And both of them were to be elective. There was a question about whether there should be a property qualification for the upper house, but certainly that wasn't the case in the lower house. Then they said that the governor should be appointed by the Crown, paid for by the Treasury, but should be removed on an, a vote for an address of the Crown, paying for such removal being passed by two-thirds of the whole numbers of the members of each house. So the governor was to be on a short leash, and there was a lot said in the debates about the the, the unhappy characteristics of governance. Uh, the third feature was that, in the opinion of the meeting, the population shall alone be regarded as determining the number of members of parliament to be returned by each district, and every registered elector should be eligible to be elected uh, as a member to either house. Uh, then they said, fourth, and the, this is where it gets really interesting, that in the opinion of this meeting, every adult male who should have resided in the district in which he claims to vote for six months previously to the date of registration should be qualified to vote in the election. 
every adult male. Now, it's very interesting that there was no discussion about female franchise, of which New Zealand was a leader later, but this was what they regarded as universal uh, uh, franchise. And then they said even more controversially that in the opinion of this meeting, that in the elections of members, the mode of voting should be by ballot, that is to say, secret ballot, quite unlike the sort of ballots that have been described earlier uh, at this meeting, and these people were totally opposed to that. And there was a great deal of discussion on the two issues which I think are of very interesting significance, that is to say, the universal franchise and the secret ballot. Now, of course, Secret ballot did not arrive in New Zealand until 1870, but the case was strongly made for it at this meeting uh, by the uh, various debaters. Now, uh, the, not only did they agree on a radical constitutional agenda, they carried it through the meeting by large majorities. There was a significant conservative element led by Dr. Munro, who was later the Speaker of the House, uh, but they were in favour of a lot of change as well. It's just that they weren't quite as radical as the majority. Uh, now, the, um, then uh, what happened was they published it all in the examiner, everything that happened at the meeting. Then a bit later, they prepared a memorial of what the meeting was about, and they sent the memorial to the Secretary of State in Britain, and the minority did the same thing, actually, and uh, they got excoriated by the uh, examiner for doing that uh, because they represented such a small number, uh, the examiner said. And, of course, uh, the great reform bill of uh, 1832 was a rather pale shadow of a franchise compared with what the Nelson meeting of 1850 was proposing. Uh, and I think that it's really useful if I can just uh, for a moment say that the arguments that are, I've set out in this paper are summarised because there is a sort and style of rhetoric that, damp uh, that, that characterised 19th century debate that is rather wordy and sometimes a little obtuse. Uh, but for all that, you can get these questions very carefully uh, seen. They were on the form of government, there was a lot of debate on the removal of the governor there is a lot of debate. And on universal suffrage and the secret ballot, there are clashes of very considerable uh, magnitude about what it should be. But in fact, the secret ballot carried very, by a very big majority. And it was, of course, uh, argued that what was wrong with the method of balloting that we had was that abominations uh, as committee rooms and open taverns would have to be avoided. There'd be a quite different atmosphere from the commotion and barracking that open voting uh, progress, uh, that progressed through the day. Uh, and and uh, voting was, they said, a private judgment. Uh, and you really had to do that. You couldn't, you really shouldn't even members of your own household shouldn't know, and that's partly why it should be secret. Uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about American democracy that was regarded by the people opposed to this as really dangerously populist and high, too highly democratic. Uh, but that uh, view did not prevail. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of discussion about drunkenness being an English characteristic. Uh, and the fact that that shouldn't have anything to do with elections as it did in the open voting system that was prevalent in England, about which they were speaking at great length. Now, um, they also said that uh, really the, the descriptions from the Conservatives about what was wrong with the secret ballot really make very interesting reading. Munro said at one point that a secret ballot was unmanly cowardly and un-English. <laughs> uh, and um, there's a misprint in the paper without the un. Uh, but the, the thing about this was 
that these democratic tendencies came upon the Nelson settlement very clearly as a result of the composition of the population. There were not enough capitalists that the New Zealand Company had brought. There were not enough pastoralists. There were a lot of workers. There were a lot of people who, who uh, kept the settlement together, and this was debated at length in, in these uh, discussions. That, that it wasn't the same as it was in England. And whatever you might say about England, you might not be able to do that in England, but you could certainly do it here, and you should do it here, because it's different here. Uh, and I must say that uh, I, I uh, think that the confidence and sense of boldness, the lack of political inhibition, the freedom of speech that they think that they had and could exercise even in respect to the governor, was, was remarkable. And it was a very orderly meeting. Uh, and it was carefully chaired. And, and you could see that people had done a lot of preparation for their speeches. It looked, in many ways, like a conscious act of self-determination. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, they, it was said that because of the way they'd conducted the process, that really there were no adult persons in the settlement who hadn't had, a, had their ability to be exposed to all of this. So uh, I think that it is just something that interested me, which is right, why I wrote the paper. But the conclusion I reached from it, and, and which I've read reinforced more this morning, the amount of scholarship on New Zealand constitutional history is not extensive. I expect there are many treasure, treasures buried in it, waiting to be discovered. Uh, no modern definitive constitutional history of New Zealand has been written. It would be a very worthy task uh, because uh, I think we have to make our own history here as well as our inherited uh, history and springing from our own soil and experience look to me to be some pretty rich traditions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Geoffrey, thank you. We have a few moments now that we could take a few questions. Anyone like to kick off? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if any of the panel want to respond or we look for another question. I don't believe in God, but I do believe in a new constitution. <laughs> <laughs> do we have another question in the audience? I think Damon might want to respond. To Damon? Um, uh, the question put me in mind of uh, one thing I didn't mention in the, in the presentation. Um, the, the former Chief Justice Martin sends a memo, or Gore Brown gets Martin to send a memo to London to try and counterbalance the, uh, the report that the ministers uh, send attacking the idea that Māori should be allowed to get, to get the vote. Um, 
and one of the ideas that Martin had throughout his career was that um, Māori and Pākehā were going to be able to form a single community in part because they would be able to share a confessional community. And um, one of the things that is common about lots of constitutional theorising about colonies in the 18th 30s is, that, is the idea that for the theory of assimilation to work you had to create a community in a number of different settings. So Gray thought that economics and commerce was going to create a shared sense of um, culture and a shared sense of uh, wants and needs. Um, so the idea of religious community com comes into that as a significant factor. What <coughs> is interesting about the franchise debates is that more and more across the 1850s the focus is on property and property ownership as a way of defining the relationship between Māori and, um, and the Crown and Māori and, and other settlers. Uh, and I don't think this, this doesn't actually, I'm not going to tell you what faith you should have in now, Miranda, sadly, but I think that it suggests that um, there are a number of ways that people saw political communities being, consti or communities being constituted. Uh, and part of the reason that the revision courts are so um, contested is that that's a community that lots of Pākehā want to keep uh, insulated to some degree and there have been such battles to get the Pākehā members of that community to find the particular ways. Oh. Um, just the other point I can make very quickly, um, it's a useful reminder that um, things which we now think of as private matters, as matters of private law, are actually fairly significant to defining how the constitution functioned and structured and, and was structured mm -hmm. in the past. And confessional status and the relationship between the Crown and, and churches and the Crown oh. subjects is a, a useful example of that. Um, just, just building on that, I was uh, interested in the extent to which um, New Zealanders, and particularly the Church of England group, corresponded with politicians and others in the UK and I suspect probably Damon and Hickford have both come across some of those things. I mean, the letters were circulated and so were the British newspapers and the, and the uh, sensitivity of New Zealanders at the comments being made, particularly in the 1860s and in the wars period, is really an interesting in itself. Martin and others um, circulating British politicians, etc., on the New Zealand Maori behalf, which is quite interesting. I'd like to ask a question if unless there's another question. I, I've been interested in the connections uh, that people had with the United States and what was going on there in the development of law, starting with Busby, who went to see a Justice Story, um, and the, which is interesting in itself. But um, in the 1860s, once again, um, some of the era, people who were in political life then were feeling away for an evolution of things in New Zealand. I'd, would anyone on the panel like to comment on that? There's Sir a Jeffrey. reference in the debates that I looked at that Justice Chapman went to the United States and wrote a pamphlet on what was happening in American democracy. Mm. This, it turned out to be pretty... Uh, a lot of people have read it. Yeah. <laughs> 1830s. 1830s, yes. Any questions people would like to put before we break for lunch? No? Uh, Claudia, you might have uh, any comments to make now for the rest of the day? Um, perhaps before we do that, I'd like to ask uh, you to acknowledge a very good panel and the contributions they've made. <laughs>